Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you join us for the final of these uh, series of webinars that we have been conducting, uh, discussing the role of nuclear energy during and after uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, as always, um, wherever you're located, I hope that you and your loved ones are safe and healthy and that you are enduring the uh, current situation well. Um, we at the NEA have been thinking a lot about uh, the role that nuclear energy can play um, as both a part of the financial recovery after this uh, uh, event, but also more importantly, we think, uh, for the long-term future. Um, this uh, pandemic uh, will be um, met with um, significant investment by governments around the world to reinvigorate their economies, um, to build infrastructure that is strong and resilient. And we believe that nuclear energy can play a role in that, but not just because the, of the fact that nuclear energy can create uh, many important high paying jobs, but also because nuclear energy plays a very important role in helping countries around the world meet their energy and, and environmental objectives um, in a way that is both safe, cost effective, and, and very, um, appropriate if you are trying to reduce CO2 emissions. One of the big challenges that we face um, in this is financing. And of the four policy briefs that the NEA released a few weeks ago, um, financing is one that presents probably one of the most important challenges to building new nuclear power plants. Uh, I've often told the story in uh, various venues about a meeting I had with an energy minister of a member country some time ago. And when we were discussing the possible options for building new energy capacity and different technology nuclear uh, plants, the, the minister looked at me and said, um, in effect, it doesn't really matter how good the technology is if I can't afford to build it. And that's where the financing comes in. To explore this, we have assembled a very um, experienced panel to discuss the issue of financing and nuclear power. Um, among those, Mr. Cosmangita, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Nuclear Electric in Romania, was supposed to join us this morning, but unfortunately due to other factors, had to, um, had to back out at the last minute. Uh, he sends his regrets, but uh, we are also note that we understand that he is very involved and very important discussions in his country because it seems that Romania is very close to closing a deal to finance its um, third and fourth reactors at the Chernobyl site. So that's a very exciting development. I wish Mr. Gita and his colleagues well as that goes forward. And perhaps after that's done, he can come tell us how he got it financed and we'll do another seminar. Um, but we do have a great panel and uh, we will also give you a quick introduction of the policy brief on uh, financing. And to give you an overview of that, I'm going to give the floor to Sama Bilbao Leon, who is the head of the Division of Nuclear e Technology and Economics. And um, Sama, the floor is yours. Please give us an overview. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Magwood. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, and thank you for joining us today for our fourth and last uh, webinar of this series. So uh, I will do a very brief summary of our four brief, which is, as, as you probably have guessed, a focus on financing for new nuclear energy. And as Mr. Magwood uh, mentioned, this was, this was developed together with our colleagues of the World Nuclear Association. But it is also based on previous uh, publications that we had uh, uh, completed in previous years at the Nuclear Energy Agency, but also a very recent new publication that was released uh, earlier in July, so it's really hot out of the presses that also has uh, some of the key points that we are going to discuss today related to, to financing for, for new nuclear. So if we go to the next slide, we can actually uh, put this whole thing in perspective, because of course, uh, it's not only financing uh, energy infrastructure, but doing so within the con context of this COVID-19 crisis. So we know that uh, OECD governments, and of course, governments from all over the world are really trying to, to balance out the, the, the desire to have this economic rec recovery that preserves both 
the ambition to having an affordable energy transition, but at the same time to, to be able to, to have long-term economic development, uh, both in the social and environmental objectives also. So in this sense, uh, it is very crucial to make sure that we set up a framework that allows investment in sectors that contribute to local, national, and regional economic growth and employment uh, uh, prospects. So in this sense, uh, areas such as roads, railways, healthcare, energy, and electricity infrastructures, and any other uh, uh, systems that are going to contribute to elevate to the, the quality of life for the society as a whole are going to be the primary targets for this uh, economic recovery uh, financing. So in order to make sure that this financing is going to be uh, successful, it is important to make sure that the proper policy and market frameworks are going to be in place to really in, in incentivize investment in this essential infrastructure. And let me just say, when we are talking about uh, energy, it is important that the investors have, uh, have frameworks that allow them to, to have clarity on the long-term revenues for all low carbon generation technologies, nuclear, hydro, and of course, uh, variable renewable energy. Because all these technologies are, as you know, are characterized by a very high fixed investment cost, even though their variable operating costs are quite low. So this means that uh, we really need to have market clarity, but also uh, some regulatory provisions that are going to be al to allow uh, sharing the risk about the vendors, the investors, the operators, and the electricity consumers to make sure that the overall uh, risks of a, a infrastructure project are shared among all the all the uh, stakeholders so in this sense having a technology neutral criteria and, and frameworks that are applicable to all the low carbon technologies are going to be quite useful and of course uh, among uh, all the energy infrastructure we feel that nuclear energy uh, is being recognized as one of the, as, as having large potential to contribute to decarbonization. Uh, not only because also has, it will provide energy security and uh, it will contribute to the economic recovery uh, in areas such as the socioeconomic benefits uh, associated with the high skill local jobs uh, that are uh, well remunerated that this technology is going to create. So let's, let's look at uh, the next slide in which we see that even though uh, there are great opportunities for, for nuclear to contribute to, to all this economic recovery, we can see how in general, nuclear projects are typically misaligned with the traditional sources of, of financing. So as you know, uh, nuclear power plants uh, typically are large uh, and complex infrastructure undertakings that at some point can present significant fi financial risks. And of course, there is two main characteristics of these projects. Number one, they are very capital intensive, but also given the size, typically we have been uh, used to build very large nuclear power plants in the order of one gigawatt or so. Uh, so the, the amount of capital uh, needed upfront is quite large. But also because of the multi-decadal uh, uh, project timelines, these projects are typically not well aligned with the, the traditional uh, private sources of capital uh, that, that, that don't really have uh, the risk and the, and the cost benefit analysis that these traditional sources are going to do don't quite match uh, these lifetimes and this capital intensive nature of nuclear. And of course, uh, I think that is important uh, for you to, to realize, I think that this graphic that we are showing here is quite important because it really shows that while investment costs, of course, are quite important for any uh, capital invest in, in intensive uh, project, they are particularly, uh, they could be particularly important for new nuclear projects. So in this, uh, in this graph, you see that uh, 
they could, the investment cost could represent up to 78% of the levelized cost of electricity for a new nuclear power plant, depending on, on how the, the, the contracting and financial uh, arrangements are being made. So, so it is quite important to make sure that the uh, escalation of this capital cost for, new, for a new plan is, is under control. Of course, uh, we have seen in recent times that there has been a little bit of a loss of confidence in, in Western uh, nuclear new nuclear projects due to the la delays and a cost of the runs. So let's go to the, to the next slide where uh, we would look at some of the, the reasons why this has been this way. So uh, in, in this recent report that I mentioned earlier that we released earlier in, in, in July, we actually discussed how uh, the, the reasons and, and the lessons learned from this uh, first of a kind uh, Gen 3 reactor uh, construction projects in Western countries. So we see that right now, uh, the, the, the design maturity uh, of, all, of all these projects has reached a point in which there is uh, a great opportunity for, for uh, uh, investment uh, from, from, from countries in these different projects. So uh, let me just highlight some of the things that even though uh, these first of a kind projects uh, have experienced some delays and some uh, cost overruns. There is really, uh, we are really moving beyond these challenges faced by these projects. And we are seeing opportunities for very large uh, cost reductions. And this, only, this applies not only to the generation three reactors that, that are being built in many places, but also for the small modular reactors and for some uh, fourth generation reactor systems that are also making a steady progress towards demonstration projects. So, but in all of those cases, uh, securing affordable and cost-effective financing is going to be critical. So, and let me just say that we have evidence from recent nuclear projects in China, Korea, Russia, the United Arab Emirates, that uh, in fact, uh, nuclear projects can be completed on time and on budget. This means, of course, that the problems that we have experienced in, in Western first of a kind project are really not intrinsic to a nuclear power plant, but they, they are intrinsic to maybe the project arrangements itself. So we see that uh, things such as design standardization and the commitment to a uh, multi-unit serial construction programs are going to be quite critical to secure lowest, lower costs in, in these units. But as I say, uh, uh, regardless of how well the, the nuclear sector can, can reduce the actual cost of construction for these projects, securing the finance is going to be just as important. So let's go to the next slide in which we see that uh, the role that governments are going to, to have in supporting the financing of these uh, nuclear, new nuclear projects, it is going to be quite important. So, so, and of course, there is many ways in which this financial support may take place. So as, as we described here, there are a number of financial models that can be applied to these large uh, scale infrastructure projects. And, and, and all these different uh, pro, uh, mechanisms can actually, can actually support an efficient allocation and mitigation of the construction and the market risks associated to all these projects. So uh, and the, the different models that we mentioned here are could be direct financial support from governments. It could be indirect financial support uh, uh, depending on whatever is appropriate. So for example, uh, direct financial support could be done by undertaking equity ownership in, in, uh, in initial projects or by issuing public loans. Uh, the government ownership of initial projects will have an enormous impact both uh, from the financing, uh, financing aspects, but also because it would inspire confidence among um, private investors, and also it would send, send, send a very important signal to the society as a whole. 
uh, alternative uh, public finance approach could be could be done uh, um, using uh, uh, different approaches that can lead to a lowest co lower cost of capital uh, as governments considering electricity as an essential national infrastructure infrastructure are likely to accept lower rates of return than the private sector so some of these indirect approaches uh, could be in the form of the regulated uh, asset-based models, uh, which I think we will hear a little bit later. And also, there may be a large private-private uh, uh, partnership uh, frameworks that, that can be also very useful. So I know that uh, we have Ms. Uh, Julia Pack that will tell, tell us quite a li little bit about this later in the, in the presentation. But in summary, I think that what, what we really want to emphasize here is that uh, the government support is going to be essential to uh, maintain uh, nuclear programs because it's going to be I mean it could be transitional and it could be different it would take different shapes depending on the specific situation for the country but the idea here is to uh, move into a, a positive circle uh, of, of uh, investment so let me go to another important point that we made in our in our uh, brief which is related to the importance of also considering newcomer countries that also are going to need cost effective financing to deploy new nuclear uh, projects so as you know many uh, so when we are looking at global decarbonization is not only developed countries but also um, economies in transition and developing countries are very seriously evaluating nuclear energy as a potential component of the long-term decarbonization plan. So this means uh, that it is important to, to ensure that these countries are provided with opportunities to finance these projects if they in fact choose to do them. So historically, we have had uh, export credit agencies from the, from the vendor country that have helped uh, with this financing. Uh, but also we have uh, in the past, we have had the World Bank or the European Investment Bank financing uh, nuclear projects. Uh, for example, also the, the, development, the Development Bank of Latin America has also done that in recent times. So this means that it is quite important uh, to ensure that there is uh, institutions, I mean, that the role of these institutions uh, to support the development of sustainable and economic energy infrastructure is being recognized. And, and these uh, multilateral banks and nat national export agencies are, uh, they create uh, technology neutral criteria that allow countries to get financial support for these projects if they choose to, to, to do so. So let me just close very quickly to highlight uh, with the conclusions uh, in the next slide uh, or what uh, new uh, policy makers may do. So number one, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is quite important in our opinion uh, that uh, government support is provided from nuclear energy projects. Uh, this could be transitional and targeted, but, but it is quite important. So this may leverage uh, the, the attraction of cost-effective private financing for, for these projects, and it will also uh, help uh, to, to ensure that the window of opportunity that the nuclear sector has achieved after the recent uh, first of a kind projects will continue with the current momentum. And finally, uh, it is quite important in our opinion to develop uh, frameworks to unlock the financing for nuclear energy projects in developing countries if they choose to, to, to do so. So with this, uh, Mr. Magwood, I, I uh, return the, the, the floor to you. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. I appreciate the overview. I think that gives us a good context for the conversation we're having today. Uh, so let me ask the panel to uh, all come online and join us on video. Um, we, uh, again, we'll, we'll miss Mr. Gita, but we know that he's very busy doing extremely important things back in his home country. 
but uh, we do have the other three panelists, and I, I look at this as an opportunity to talk with each of you in greater depth, so we're looking forward to the conversation today. So first, let me introduce Mr. Sean uh, Kidney, who is co-founder and CEO of Climate Bond Initiative, which is an NGO working to mobilize global capital for climate action. Projects include a green book definitions and certificate scheme with 34 trillion of assets represented on its board. It also works with Chinese Central Bank to, on how to grow green bonds in, in China, uh, market development programs in Brazil, Mexico, and ASEAN and Africa, and also market tracking services for green bonds industry. So we look, this gives us a very good framework for conversation. Mr. Kidney, the floor is yours. Thanks, William. Thanks very much for the opportunity to join you. So uh, I'm not going to speak about nuclear. It's not my expertise and not my brief. What I'm going to speak about is what's happening in the world of sustainable finance and in particular green bonds. We're, we're the global NGO for green bonds, if you like. Um, and there's some story behind that. And there are some issues for nuclear to, to address if it wants to be part of that market, which is a market. Uh, a market, of course, mediated in many cases by government involvement through blended finance schemes and so on, which is the sort of things that are covered in the NEA briefing paper, or, or alluded to, I should say. So this market first is a, a market for use of proceeds debt. It's a very simple thing, this green bond. All it is, is a bond where someone promises to use it for green investments or projects of one sort or another. So to give you an example, if um, uh, William wanted to borrow money to buy a car from his, uh, from his uncle, and the uncle said, yes, I'm happy to lend you the money as long as you guarantee it, but I only want you to buy an electric vehicle, well, that would be a green loan. And William would be required to turn up every Christmas to take his uncle for a drive the electric vehicle to show that he still owns it and he hasn't sold it and bought a Maserati. <laughs> That's essentially it. So it's a very simple idea. Because it's a simple idea, pretty well anyone who can issue debt can issue green debt. Because there's no difference from a structuring or for that matter from a credit perspective. And this market has grown up slightly differently to what I'd call the ESG market. The environmental, social and governance market, which arose out of equity investments, is essentially looking at more sophisticated approaches to understanding sustainability of returns. So that will involve you looking at environmental concerns, social issues that are seen to be pertinent to the sustainability of investment, and of course, governance issues, which are proving to be quite a good predictor of the sustainability of returns over time. And remember, we're talking about over time. So this is a market that's dominated by institutional investors looking for returns over time. It doesn't mean they might churn their portfolio, as they do seeking short-term benefit as well as long-term benefit, but they're extremely interested in long-term indicators. And some of them, a collection in the insurance industry, have appetite for long-tenor issuance, substantial long-tenor issuance, so they can match their assets and liabilities, so that when Sama finally retires in 2050, they make, can make sure they can cash in those bonds to be able to pay out her retirement fund. And that's the assets and matches liabilities. They're not necessarily after the yield, they're after certainty of return. And in fact, there's a quote from um, Larry Fink, the founder of BlackRock, who says he didn't make money with BlackRock by giving people yield. He made money by making sure they never lost their money. And that gives you a bit of a sense of what are the features of the bond market are. And that gives you a hint of what the drivers might be. So for the folks that back this bond market, I need to stress this is still a small market, but it's material. It's about a trillion dollars US outstanding. I think currently we're tracking at about 3% of global issuance. I mean, 55% of global issuance is sovereigns, and we haven't really made a debt in sovereigns. So it's a little bit better once you start looking at, uh, at, a, at, a, smaller, at the smaller part of it. But it's fastest growing, and it's been until this year the fastest growing asset class on the planet. Yeah, small start a few years ago. We had about 258 billion US issued last year. Europe is the largest market. China is the second largest market. This is not a Western thing only. We've been working with PBOC, the Central Bank in China, for the last seven years, and they've put in regulations and bought in something I'll come back to a little later, which is a green bond projects catalogue 
to regulate the market in terms of what can be called green in China. So fast growing market, lots of issuers. We see issuers from uh, corporates, development banks, subnationals, um, banks of all sorts. We've seen in the last couple of years, the growth of a sovereign market, but still very small compared to global sovereign issuance. I think we're at about 60 billion or 65 billion outstanding in the sovereign green bond market so far, with France having 25 billion of that, with its um, green sovereign bond program. In none of these labelled thematic instruments are we seeing nuclear issuance yet in the international markets, just to be clear. Of course, this is just a labelling scheme. These things are important to ma you know, as marketing to match buyers to sellers. It's useful. A good tick on the Bloomberg list makes a difference to people participating in this particular market. We do publish at the Climate Bonds Initiative dozens of reports on the green bond market, one on labelled green bonds. In fact, we've just published in the last few days an update report. And we also publish each year a report on what we call climate aligned bonds. These are bonds that are demonstrably relevant to climate, even though the issuer may not have made any claims about the climate relevance. Santa Fe railways, for example, low carbon transport, um, Russian railways for many years. We do include nuclear bonds in there. We include bonds which have been issued by companies such as EDF, where the proceeds can be demonstrably seen to be allocated to only to low carbon investments. So in that sense, we've recognized the nuclear market in the past. Some investors do use that data set from us, and that's about uh, 900 billion outstanding in that particular data set uh, globally, uh, in Western markets largely, uh, dominated by transport, but there is energy in there. But the bulk of the market likes the formality of the labeling because they're reporting and transparency. So in the formality of the labeling, they can be sure that William will turn up each year at his uncle's and show him off, show off the car and take him for a drive and to prove it still exists. And that's a benefit to investors looking for some kind of confidence on reporting and the continued allocation of proceeds. They're not so keen on someone like um, uh, Iberdrola borrowing the money and then investing in oil and gas or property. They're looking for insurance against that, essentially. So this is a, a market which has been driven by the concern of investors around environmental challenges the planet faces. Now, it has not been driven by investors being concerned, I'm going to call it on the basis of sentiment. Um, it's been driven rather on the basis of risk. So there is a significant concern by investors that in the coming years, we are going to see increased and significant climate risk impacts. On the adaptation side, there will be physical impacts. We've already seen the reinsurance industry shift significantly in its liability uh, performance and now in its asset management performance according to this. So Swiss Re, Munich Re set up climate change research centers in the mid nineties, for example, to examine this. And we've now seen the withdrawal of insurance from some areas like coastal property in Florida. You'll be interested to know that Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump's estate in Florida, is not backed by commercial reinsurance or insured by commercial reinsurance. It's backed by the Florida State Reinsurance Company because Florida State decided to step in into territory where commercial reinsurers would not step in anymore because they don't believe climate change is a big issue. And that, of course, increases the liability risk for Florida, etc. Commercial investors are concerned about this. They're also concerned about policy impact risks. We've seen in the last 25 years, as you, as you know, uh, significant value destruction in the utility or the, and the energy sector for various reasons, but significantly some of that is related to policy impact. Now, it's not just policy impact of, say, the German government trying to bias the system towards different sorts of energy uses. It's about the slightly unintended consequences of some significant initiatives, such as the feed-in tariff that Germany introduced in 2001, and then more importantly, the massive investments in solar renewable that China introduced a few years later, and then quickly became the largest investor in renewables in the world. That has driven down the price point. So now we have, as a result of that mass procurement 
as a result of government policy, a continuing rapid reduction in price points around those renewables, triggered by volume production. And in fact, you've seen volume production migrate towards the largest market, China now, with then a flow-on effect. So India gets cheaper solar because of Chinese state action. There's an appreciation by investors now that this is coming across the board. Since the 2015 Paris Climate Change Agreement, I guess, this is a certainty, not a possibility. The only question is if and how, and that induces an anxiety. We have a freight train coming to us. We're not quite sure where it is or where it's going to hit us, or we know it's coming towards us. How do we mitigate the risks of being impacted by this major policy change? Well, one of the ways you can mitigate is to reallocate some of your investments where you can within your existing risk yield methodologies towards investments that might be seen to be lower risk. And that is, for example, green bonds. So green bonds are generally seen to be an indicator that that entity is doing something that's likely to be less at risk of being hit by policy changes going forward. And some of the indicators you see in the green bond market along these lines are price depression across bond issuance by green bond issuers, which is reported occasionally, and stock price bounces. So in Europe, when a corporate issues a green bond, as a rule, they'll get a stock price bounce and it'll stay up, i.e. the green bond issuance is an indicator. In fact, in some markets like Sweden, which is um, to, its, uh, uh, to its credit, the largest per capita green bond issuer in the world, uh, investors tell me that when someone comes out of a bond, if it's not green or if they haven't done a green bond, one of the questions that the institutional investors ask them is, um, is there something we should know about your portfolio? Is there a problem here? And so on. So this is a sign of changing markets. But I want to stress, it's a risk anxiety that drives appetite in this particular market. There is a appetite to understand and get some visibility on the sorts of things that are less likely to be impacted by policy changes that are in the process of coming through or will come through globally. Now, in the secondary market, you also see another factor playing out. Because of the appetite for these, the increased appetite, and these are way oversubscribed, more so than vanilla bonds, you get um, pr price differential. So we have a green bonds being a premium product in hard currency secondary markets. And more, even more interestingly than that, going back to Larry Fink's comment about protecting plants and making sure they don't lose money, in downturns, green bonds hold their value compared to ordinary bonds. So they become a value retention product. And that increases their value in the secondary market and helps to press primary prices. So there is a, a frequent side, frequently cited primary price benefit for green bond issuance. I'm not going to go into the details of that beyond to say there's data around, you can have a look at the reports. That's the background to it. So the big developments the last few years have been the introduction of regulation and taxonomies. China started this off. Well, first, the Climate Bonds Initiative introduced a taxonomy of climate investments about eight years ago, which has been a, a guidance, of, a voluntary guidance for the market used by many investors and issuers in Europe. The MDBs have their own taxonomy, of course, their own approaches to these. China introduced this green produce catalog to guide the market. You cannot issue a green bond and label it green in China unless it meets the definitions in the taxonomy. That taxonomy has recently been up, updated. It's out for consultation now, version two. And then in the last few years, Europe has done the same thing. For the last two years, I've been working with the European Commission on developing an EU taxonomy of sustainable finance. And I guess this is one of the reasons I'm on the call today. Um, we have looked at a range of investments through a climate lens. We do, in fact, have multiple environmental objectives in that process that we're pursuing. Circular economy, protection of natural environment, etc., pollution prevention. But the two dominant ones we were asked to look at first were climate change, mitigation and adaptation. We've produced a taxonomy that I would say is 90% of the way there there's still definitely another 10% to tackle going forward. The commission is currently turning that into regulation. This is a disclosure guidance and a guidance for the green bond market. In Europe, under the sustainable uh, finance disclosure regulation that's coming in, all investors, banks and corporates will be reporting in a, 
uh, in a voluntary fashion in the next two years till it becomes mandatory after 2021 on their climate exposures, both in terms of risks and sustainable investments they hold in line with the taxonomy. So this is an attempt to have comparable reporting from all the institutions in Europe, rather than what we have now, which is a hodgepodge of different sorts of methodologies and approaches, which are organizational specific. In other words, comparability is very hard. Now, we can have a discussion later on about what that means, but the key point is, this taxonomy is there, it's going to regulation. Nuclear is in limbo. While we have brought in very clear rule sets about emissions profiles in the electricity generation sector, and we've said to be called sustainable, which means in line, consistent with achieving the Paris Agreement goals, 1.5 degrees, you have to have an emissions threshold of 100 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour or less, which will decline in the next 30 years until we get to net zero. And that's a life cycle analysis. I appreciate in the nuclear industry, there's been criticism of a lack of an adequate understanding of life cycle analysis and low carbon science-based approaches. Let me be clear on one thing. We have said very explicitly in the taxonomy that nuclear is low carbon. I appreciate there are many shibboleth arguments around these, but we, there is no doubt whatsoever in the minds of the European Union technical expert group on that. However, we have also been tasked with adding an extra filter to our substantive contributions argument, which is called do no significant harm. And in that measure, we've been asked to look at whether an, an investment or a project or an asset or an activity, which would meet the substantial contribution criteria to climate mitigation, for example, or climate adaptation, might have other consequences which deliver some kind of environmental harm. You can't build a solar farm and a wetland, for example, that sort of thing. And we've said quite explicitly, you can't build a low carbon railway line to a coal mine because solid fossil fuels are explicitly excluded by request of the European Parliament. And that would be a do no significant harm measure. There is a question mark that we were not able to resolve around waste disposal and nuclear. I don't need to tell you what those controversies are. You know better than I do. We were not able to resolve them. We're a pro bono committee. We had conflicting advice, including advice from governments. You can guess which governments. We've said that we could not draw a line on this, so therefore we've asked the Commission to further investigate the matter of nuclear on the do no significant harm issues and whether it should or should not be included in the sustainable finance taxonomy. And as a result in the green bond market in Europe, and in various other measures or markets around sustainable finance, sustainable loans, et cetera, et cetera. And I stress that uh, green bonds is only one instrument. There are multiple instruments now using the same framework of use of proceeds for green investments. The joint research centers have started work on an investigation into that. They will be providing a report to the European Commission. There are at least three layers of investigation at a European Union level before this matter will advance the Commission first, and that'll end up with a member state discussion. I think you all know what the member state discussion is likely to be. I can't tell you what the outcome of this process is going to be and where it's going to end up, because it is caught up in those sorts of issues. What I can tell you is the JRC will be doing a science-based report to make suggestions to the Commission about how to proceed. That's the key thing I'd leave on the table today. There is a huge market here. There is extraordinary appetite. William quoted that uh, on our investor table, we have $34 trillion represented. That's about right. The number of investors, particularly asset owners, who are now influencing their fund managers, like BlackRock and State Street, who are concerned about environmental climate issues and want some confidence about their investments being consistent with that anxiety, but who don't have the due diligence capacity to make calls on whether this is in or this is out. This market is huge. We have said in the TEG, the Technical Expert Group, that science-based criteria are absolutely what the world, what Europe, what every country needs to be using now. We spent 30 years getting caught up in 
policy issues where we need to be listening to our scientists. The way forward is a science-based issue. But I can't tell you how that science-based investigation will unfold over the next six to nine months in come, when it comes to nuclear in Europe that's subject to processes. And of course, there are differing views among science, some scientists around these sorts of issues. I won't try and canvass them now. So there will be debate. And then there will be debate before we finished on this particular hot potato issue, which has become a hot potato issue at a member state level. That we will not be escaping. I'll stop there. Thank you for the chance to speak. Thank you very much, Sean. It's an extremely interesting and comprehensive um, um, overview of your activities in the green bond market and, and many other issues. And let me let me start close to where you ended, which is the um, the taxonomy discussion. Uh, first, let me say very clearly that we see this as a very uh, as a as a matter for EU member states to sort out. Um, we're not an EU organization, so we don't we don't participate directly in these conversations. However, um, many of our members are EU uh, states, and several of them have asked us to provide factual information about uh, nuclear and some of the issues that were raised in this context. And uh, in that respect, we recently released a document um, that highlights the realities related to nuclear waste management and disposal. Um, and nuclear waste was raised as a, as a, as a big issue in the do no significant harm discussion. Um, and the information we release highlights that there really is an international scientific consensus uh, regarding the ability of states to dispose of nuclear waste safely. There really is no um, scientific discussion. It's, to, me, to me, it's much like a climate discussion. You know, there are people who say there's debate on climate, but the fact that 99.9% .9 of the scientists say that climate, is real, climate change is real to, many people will say, well, that means the debate is over. It's very much the same with nuclear waste. You may find somebody somewhere that says nuclear waste disposal is impossible, but that person is in a very tiny, bizarre minority and really doesn't, doesn't is not representative of the scientific consensus. Uh, so our, our, our document highlights that. So, but I appreciate, I appreciate your overview. I think you did an excellent overview of the, of the discussion. One, one, one thing that occurs to me as I listen to your your, your, your monologue on this is that um, governments, either through regulation or uh, taxonomy or other mechanisms, are becoming more involved in, in the energy markets. And to the, to the point where many people we interact with believe that we are moving in a direction to where there really is not going to be um, a, a real market. And, and energy in the future. There's going to really be a government-controlled uh, platform um, for, for exercising whatever uh, particular governments want to see built and operated, uh, but that, not, that these decisions are not going to be made on a real market basis. And I wonder if you'd like to react to that. I think you'd be hard-pressed to win an argument, William, that nuclear has ever operated outside of um, active government state action to support it. So I'm not so sure this is particularly a new idea when it comes to nuclear energy at least. And um, rather the reverse for nuclear, I, I would say the opportunity for nuclear and commercial market is very low. The only way it's gonna go forward, and I think your NEA briefing paper essentially said this, is going to be with some kind of strong state action uh, around it. That's my first point. My second point is that generally in markets, look, energy has largely been, and I have to say most successfully been grown in times of strong state action. I mean, the electricity generation in the US in the 1950s was grown on the back of capacity remuneration schemes to ensure that we actually could leave the lights on all the time. And God knows South, places like South Africa need this at the moment. And that's strong state action and highly managed energy markets. Energy markets, uh, you know, I often talk about being uh, free markets, but they're not. They're, they're created and highly managed markets. That's my, my second point. My last point is about change. So one of the mistakes we made about um, 10 years ago when we were thinking about addressing climate change 
that we might be able to use market forces. Look, we're at a stage now where the world has to change very, very quickly. You will know whether your children have any kind of future by 2030. It's a reasonable future to live in. The stakes are extraordinarily high. The IPCC says that we have to get down emissions by 50% in 10 years globally. As you know, that's not an easy thing. Emissions went down 8% this year, or at least they're projected to by your cousins at the IEA uh, or your friends at the IEA. And they have to average, average 7.6% per annum out to 2030 to be able to have even a 50-50 chance of avoiding utterly catastrophic climate change. And utterly catastrophic climate change is something we don't really understand. In the 1600s, we had two degrees global cooling as a result of carbon drawdown by the Americas, American Indians being wiped out by smallpox and measles. And in that period, we lost a third of the world's population through to famine, war, and pandemics, pandemics after pandemic. The, IEA, the IPCC Health Committee has been predicting this for many years. This is actually one of the pandemics that the IPCC Health Committee has been predicting would happen and it's going to happen regularly. This is, this is stuff that's going to happen anyway. And now we're talking about catastrophic changes worse than that. So the time frame is very short to act to avoid the kind of catastrophe that we do not want our children to be, have to live in and survive in. Now that means we are going to have to aggressively manage our energy systems as well as our transport, our agriculture and various other systems to be able to shift them. If we're gonna get them down 50% in 10 years, and when I say you'll know whether your children are gonna have any kind of real life, if we haven't got them down 50% in 10 years, the prognosis, and this is risk, everything's risk, right? <laughs> this is not, nothing certain in life, but the, the risk levels become absurd of the kind of prognosis that we do not wanna see. Now, governments have to act. Governments have to do whatever it takes, I'm going to argue, and we are learning in this crisis, in the COVID crisis, something about whatever it takes. It's been an illuminating experience for us all on the policy side of when urgency is there, what can be done haphazardly, chaotically. We are running a crazy global experiment in really bad action and really good action. Hopefully at the end of this year, we will have a very clear idea of what are the right kind of measures to take when the next pandemic comes, not to mention the kind of measures to take to reflate our economies, get people back to work and so on, because we'll have countries that have made this happen well, and we've had countries that have messed this up as we're seeing happen in some places already. So when it comes to energy, bear all that in mind. State action is going to be absolutely necessary. There will be many countries who won't need to take state action. All the small economies in the world, as we have seen with solar, the reducing cost of solar, will just get the side benefit of the elephants in the room taking action. They will get cheaper X, Y, and Z electric vehicles, for example. China is taking aggressive action on electric vehicles. The new infrastructure investment plan, the trillions of, of renminbi, has 59% of the money allocated towards electric vehicle support. We will see electric vehicles become cheaper on a CapEx basis the next two to three years globally. For the rest of the world, they won't be making any policies that decisions about electric vehicles. They'll just be buying them because they're cheaper. They're already cheaper OPEX, as you know, especially if they're running a low-cost nuclear state, I guess. I'll leave that to your, your modeling. And that's an example of the kinds of policy action that will drive the global economy in the next few years, which investors understand is happening, by the way. So when people talk about, I'm going to say, fiddling the energy market, damn right. We have to fiddle the energy market to achieve the outcome with one clear focus in mind, emissions, emissions, emissions. And that means a number of things that we haven't understood. The window for unabated gas has gone. This was Fatih Birol saying this in the 2018 World Energy Outlook as a result of our IEA modeling on the Paris Agreement. We cannot be building any more new fossil fuel unabated investments. If we're to meet the Paris Agreement, for example, we need to dramatically reduce emissions in the existing fossil fuel infrastructure. We have to focus on fossil fuels now and everything else is secondary to go forward. 
that will require a lot of state action. There's my response, William. I don't know if that's the answer you expected. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's a good answer because it's a truthful one. But I, I think that represents part of the problem because um, the global conversation, the conversation here from, um, from energy ministries around the world is that there is a, there's a market and that nuclear and other um, technologies have to compete on this market. Um, but what you just said was, well, no, not really. Uh, we're, the governments are going to decide um, who, who, who makes electricity and who doesn't, and that we have to do that to achieve our climate goals. And I, I, I completely respect that don't, and, and, and actually don't necessarily even disagree with it. But that is not what people are saying. People are saying something very different. And, and that creates this strange dynamic that we often see where we're, we're telling the private sector, go compete in the market on one hand, but on the other hand, um, the cards are decked or st the deck is stacked against them uh, one way or another. And, and uh, I think, I think and, and let, me, let me sort of follow that up by highlighting that, um, and I think you, you've mentioned this when you talked about the, um, the value impacts that we've seen in electricity, in electricity markets and, and, and others. Uh, prices being at historic lows um, for, for, for a few years now. Here, here we are in the market where in some countries, and I've been told this by, by, by um, uh, power uh, companies, that they can't really even afford to make investments in future plant and equipment and transmission lines unless they get some kind of support or subsidy from the government because the market prices are so low they can't afford to do it. So these aren't really markets anymore anyway, are they? It would seem to be a bit, a bit of a misnomer. You're right. But, um, you know, I, I do want to say, from my perspective, the next 10 years of what count, what counts, how much nuclear could contribute in the next 10 years is a bit open for question, particularly in countries where the, law, where the production and delivery times are long, such as in Europe. And so, therefore, how much of a priority in that most urgent mix dealing with the nuclear question is could be up for grabs in that area all i would say to any country is your first and most urgent priority is emissions whatever you might do and that's short-term emissions you know we need to help poland transition quickly out of coal by any stretch and gas is not an interim solution because any gas being built in poland now unfortunately is not consistent with the paris agreement and will be have to be, from an environmental perspective, a stranded asset. From a credit perspective, that's a managed issue. So if you're going to maintain your nuclear as part of your mix, I'm going to say that's low carbon. What I'm not going to say is, is it a good idea to build new nuclear from an environmental perspective? I appreciate your comments earlier. I don't know. It's not my area of expertise and not my job to make that decision. My job is to say it's low carbon that we have to deal with and anything that isn't low carbon should not be on the table. Whatever we do in the future, it will be a mixture of low carbon technologies. There are many countries that are still pursuing nuclear, not just Romania, but China, of course, and, and India and so on. So therefore, it's clearly going to be part of the mix. Is it a huge part of the mix? I don't know. The IEA models don't seem to suggest it's going to be a major slice of the mix, or could be, for reasons beyond my area of expertise and their biggest areas otherwise. But like I said, I sort of don't care. I just want to close down coal and gas super fast. <laughs> well, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to move on to the other speakers. We have a lot of questions for you. A lot of them have to do with the EU taxonomy and whether it, it's fair or scientifically based. And I, I think you've kind of responded to that. So I'm not going to ask those questions again. Uh, but I, but when, we, but when, when we finish the other speakers, I, I do want to give Sama a chance to react a little bit to what you said about whether nuclear can play a role, because that's something we've done a lot of work in, and there's new technologies coming to the fore that, that really could change this conversation. So we'll have a little bit on that a little bit later. So that's just a warning for Sama to, to think about what to say about that. So we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, which is Julia Pike, who is Director of Financing for Sizewell B, who probably has a little bit different view on the nuclear issue. Uh, Julia is director uh, of, of financing for Sizewell B and is working with the government 
to identify innovative ways for Sizewell C and Moorside to be funded at best value to electricity uh, consumers and with potential investors and lenders to raise ca the capital required. Prior to her um, work with Sizewell B, she was head of power and renewables for UK, US, Europe um, at Herbert Smith Freehills LLP. Uh, from there, she led a cross-practice team advising on nuclear, wind, biomass, and tidal projects. Julia is a fellow of the Energy Institute, a member of CBI Energy and Climate Change Board of the Advisory Board for uh, Business and Community uh, East of England. So, uh, Julia, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Bill. So, I'm not sure I would necessarily disagree with that much of what Sean said, apart from the focus only on the 2020s. Um, but uh, sort of in the same way that, that sort of individual decisions about nuclear are not Sean's business, the international role of nuclear is not my business. It's my business to look at the particular. And the particular in the UK is that despite the progress we've generally made in the UK in um, bringing forward a very successful offshore wind sector in particular and with some solar, over June and July in a pandemic, with an almost unprecedented economic downturn, we've made between 40 and 50% of our electricity by burning unabated gas. So the, sit the situation in the UK demonstrates very um, clearly that you need a way of making low carbon electricity when the wind's not blowing. The wind's not been blowing for two months in the UK, it's picked up today. It's also not been blowing across a lot of Northern Europe, meaning that we haven't been able to import low carbon electricity what we've imported has been quite largely carbon electricity. So, so if you look at the particular, um, do, does, does the government play a role in pretty much all forms of electricity generation in the UK? Yes, absolutely it does. There is no real market anymore. All forms of making electricity are subsidised and they're subsidised in more or less obvious ways depending on how far um, charging the consumer is built into the business model of the um, technology. So, so um, the offshore wind industry has done a brilliant job in bringing down the cost of generation. The cost of transmission and distribution and balancing are quite high. What Im actually impacts consumer bills in the UK is a complicated mix of the cost of the individual generating technology. Nuclear is much more expensive to build and the operating cost of the technology, nuclear is cheap to operate, and the cost of, dis of transmission, distribution and balancing of the system. And because this is complicated, it doesn't lend itself to the media narrative, which tends to suggest that the individual costs of generating offshore wind versus nuclear is the media's favourite, are a relevant comparison. They're an irrelevant comparison. The issue for consumers is what does it cost to have an electricity system in which you can turn on your, um, you can turn on your lights on a, on a windless night um, and that is the cost of the system. What enables you to do that? So I, I'll just say before I start as well that I don't want to, anything I say, which is obviously pro-nuclear, to be seen as being against any other technology. Um, we strongly believe in an optimal mix. EDF itself has almost all generating technologies. It has wind, it has solar, it has the UK's largest battery. It has big EV charging businesses, and we spend around £2 million a day on R&D. Um, helping to bring forward solutions for the future. And it's in that context that we believe that nuclear is absolutely essential in the UK. It is not essential in all countries. Other countries have geothermal or they have hydro, but in the UK we have wind and wind is intermittent. So if we have I got control of the slides or can we move to the next slide? I'm not sure I do have control of them. Okay, so and, and to the next one, please. So a very quick update on Sizewell specifically. I um, very much agree with Sean that what we're really talking about in financing is risk. So this is just a very quick status update on the pre-development phase before anyone's trying to get um, uh, financial investors involved. So Sizewell C is um, in the process of obtaining its consents. All of them are submitted and there's now about an 18 month process to go until we hope to have the consents awarded. Um, people probably know that the government concluded that the way it, had, it chose that Hinckley was financed on a contract for difference was much criticised by the National Audit Office. Um, and that's because of the 
of the picture which Sama showed earlier, the cost of money is the predominant cost of nuclear to the consumer, it's not the cost of construction, despite the general media focus on the cost of construction. In the £92.50 for Hinkley, £11 is the cost of construction, around £19.50 is the cost of operations for the lifetime, and the rest of it is the cost of money. And the cost of money is broken down into two basic chunks. Part of the cost of money is, is the cost of, of financing any long-term infrastructure asset, and the, and the rest of it is the additional cost of financing a first-of-a-kind nuclear plant and in a model where interest is rolled up for the better part of 20 years before any income is received. That, that's what makes up £92.50 and that's what we want to move away from. Or rather, that's what the National Audit Office suggests that we move away from. So can we move on to the next slide? So risk, having, having achieved your consent and, and getting to the point where you, you would uh, um, expect in other technologies that private investors would come, come into play, construction risk is the next thing we have to address. So construction risk is unsurprisingly reduced when you copy what you've done before. So for Sizewell, we plan to build a copy of Hinkley. Hinkley in itself is able to show fleet benefit because it has two units. So you can see on this slide some of the productivity gains which have been made simply in a two unit plant by copying one unit um, in unit two and it's got efficiency savings like 85% on, on some aspects, 45% on other aspects. All of these tend to reduce risk. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So Sizewell is going to be a direct copy of Hinkley above ground. Everything that you can see that's green on this picture is a copy of Hinkley. That means that we understand before we start the quantities that we need. If you take just for the sake of maths, not because this is the cost estimate, a 20 billion cost estimate, roughly 10 is the cost of what I'll call stuff. So that's steel, equipment, aggregate, cable. If you know exactly what you're building before you start, then you know your cost of stuff and the risks of cost overrun on the stuff is low. And the other 10 billion is the cost essentially of labor. That breaks down into two very rough um, groups. The first group is the cost of civils and earthworks. So with Sizewell, we plan to use the same supervisory teams and the same tier one contractors so that they can bring all of that learning from Hinkley to Sizewell. So if they've reduced the cost of the time cost of installation of steel by 45% on unit two at Hinkley, we expect them to start at that reduced productivity or increased productivity level at Sizewell, meaning that we start with a um, higher expectation of productivity and a lower expectation of cost and cost overrun. And the other half of the labor cost is the cost of installing equipment where that phase is yet to commence on Hinkley, but again, we expect to move across the same tier one suppliers and the same supervisory teams to make sure that all the experience gained on Hinkley is built into Sizewell and Sizewell starts as effectively unit three of Hinkley. Should we move on to the next slide? So this is just a, 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 a picture showing how it is that we expect to reduce risk. The design for Flamanville, the French design of the EPR, which is operating in Taishan, um, an EPR takes around about 9 million tonnes of carbon out of the atmosphere a year in comparison with building a um, CCGT to make the same amount of electricity. Um, that, that design, which originated in France, was brought into the UK in 2008, and 12 years, two and a half billion pounds later, we have a detailed UK approved design and this is why we wish to replicate it exactly. So we don't re-incur design costs and people financing the project don't have to worry that the design is going to change or there's going to be a regulatory ratchet up causing design change. The regulator has agreed that we're going to build an exact copy of Hinkley at Sizewell. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So all sorts of mega projects, not just nuclear projects, all sorts of mega projects are well known for being over budget and um, late. Hinkley, in fact, although the press often reports it as late, is not late, it's bang on time. What was late is the paper process of reaching the point where we could start construction. So that's a government, essentially governmental process. 
since it started construction in 2015, it's met all of its construction milestones on time. Um, so there's an organization in the US, which you've probably mostly come across called um, the IPA and run by Ed Mero. And he's got a database of more than 5,000 projects. And he has a very good analysis of the common factors in successful projects and the common factors in unsuccessful projects. So by identifying the common success factors, we are hoping to ensure that Sizewell meets these success criteria, which if you were to, if you were to summarize them in one, in one line, it's about being well prepared. So have your design first, know exactly what you're building, use a team which preferably has built it before, um, and, and so on. That sounds very simple. When you're doing something, which as Sean says, is of an essentially governmental nature, almost all mega projects in the UK do have some extensive interaction with government, then you have to marry up the politics with the engineering. And um, that's what we're hoping to do so that Sizewell is firmly in that um, group of successes and not in the group of, of cost and time overruns. So can we move on to the next slide, please? And the next one. So this is this is very similar to the slide that Sama showed. So I'm not going to dwell on it. It's just um, it's just setting out what I explained before. This is how the £92.50 for Hinkley breaks down, and this is how this is why, as well as reducing the construction cost, which is very important and we intend to do by replication, we also have to reduce the cost of money, and that's what we need the government to decide the financing model to do. So can we move on to the next one? So if the um, building of Sizewell C were financed in the way that transmission lines are financed, so we've taken the example of the, of the terms of the regulated asset-based deal for which Scottish and Southern um, benefit, then Sizewell would cost consumers round about £40 a megawatt hour. That's with private sector investment at a standard achievable return for this nature of long-term inflation linked product. Um, if, if the price, if, if the regulated asset based deal were to impose more risk on investors than, for example, the Scottish and Southern RAB, then, and it were to look quite like the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which is a precedent project in the UK, which has taken the regulated asset based content, applied it to a singular asset, the tunnel under the Thames to clean up the um, sewage problems in the Thames and imposed more risk on investors, then the price of, of Sizewell to consumers would be higher. And, and where Sizewell is on this graph is essentially a political decision. The, the variability in this graph is not really how much does construction cost, it's really what is the cost of money. And the cost of money depends on the level of risk, which it's um, thought right to impose on investors, getting right the balance between incentivization to keep the cost down and the overall cost of the electricity to consumers. Returning to the point about what actually drives electricity bills, our modelling shows that provided nuclear comes in in the UK below around £75 a megawatt hour, then the cost of electricity bills to consumers comes down because we're not comparing nuclear with wind or solar. We're comparing nuclear with other ways of making power when the wind's not blowing. So if we move on to the next slide, what are we doing with Sizewell C? Um, Sizewell C EDF strategy post Hinkley and post COVID is that is that it uh, no longer wishes to be the on balance sheet developer, and this this gives the UK an opportunity to form a new British led approach to the ownership of of further nuclear in the UK. Um, and this is another of the questions: is who does the, who does the UK government wish? to be the owner of a large nuclear plant. Um, EDF will always remain a long-term supportive partner and an important part of the supply chain. But if the regulated asset-based model is what the government chooses, then we would expect the ownership to be divided between government itself, who would probably choose to put in an equity stake up front and then sell down as construction proceeds, um, and um, financial investors, including British pension funds, who um, are generally speaking quite keen to find long-term CPI linked, very stable um, products, provided, provided that um, it is um, appropriately rated in things like, for example, Sean, the EU taxonomy. 
And um, <laughs> you know, when we look at what's the impact of not going with nuclear, and we look at what's what happened in Germany, you know, the last thing Germany's done is open an unabated coal-fired power station. That's actually the practical consequence of closing down their nuclear, despite the, the, their um, extensive investment in wind power. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, and that is the, the that is the end of the presentation. I mean, I'd say that the final the final risk point which Sean raised, and which again I agree with, is political risk. And there's one thing about containing political risk with um, with contracts, and that 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 is an, a necessary approach. But another approach to containing political risk is what do you use the nuclear for? You know, people particularly. The, the energy the energy industry is of course riven with self-interest and you know, edf is no different in that everybody wants to portray the optimal energy mix as featuring their own technology and that makes the debate a particularly difficult debate because some positions are are, are presented as being disinterested and based on on um view of best for the planet but generally speaking people tend to promote the benefits of their own technology we believe in an optimal mix with most most um, technologies favoured. But one thing we're doing with Scythewell is, as well as looking at the, its use for electricity, we are um, putting in valves to make sure we can take out the heat at different temperatures. And that means that we, own, because in the UK, we only use around 30% of the heat the nuclear power station makes for electricity, there is a huge potential to use nuclear for heat assisted hydrogen to work with the offshore wind industry to make sure that electrolysis is as efficient as it can be, to use it for heating for industrial process, cooling data centers, and even for district heating. In other countries, heat is pumped up to around 80 kilometers still economically. So a lot of these things depend on how the government in the future chooses to price heat and carbon taxes and all sorts of things. But the uses of nuclear are potentially wide and that is in itself the best way of mitigating political risk because if the power station is embedded in and necessary to a decarbonized economy and we think it can make a huge contribution then political risk is inherently reduced well thank you very much julia that, that was a very, very interesting presentation and I, I agree with your your closing comments we um we I, i've toured um facilities that use um, Russian design reactors, VVR reactors, and it's quite common for them to use those reactors for district heating. Um, and I, I visited um, in the Czech Republic, uh, I think it was just a, a year and a half or so ago, and they're building a new um, steam line to take nuclear generated steam um, to a local community. And it's, it's the first project like that, I think, in the Czech Republic, but it's actually something that's not, not that uncommon. Um, in, in several countries. And it's, it's, it's always interesting to see that when you look at where uh, carbon emissions come from, um, industrial applications to use heat are actually a pretty significant part of the issue. I think it's around 30% come from industrial processes. You know, those don't get nearly the attention they deserve. And uh, that is certainly a place where, where nuclear can, can play a big role. Um, one 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 thing that I, I have to react to is is uh, is how quickly you agreed that the market's not really a, a factor here. That it's not that we we really have a government controlled situation. It makes me wonder whether we're using the right tools to even assess projects anymore. I mean, is is, is, is if if you're if you're if it really comes down to a policy level decision, a governmental decision, on whatever basis, whether it's the an economic basis or a scientific basis, whatever basis is really a governmental decision. Um, that that changes the conversation quite a bit, doesn't it? I mean, we're not really trying to meet, we're not building things to meet um, what market demand, we're building things to meet what we think governments will support. And is that is that where we're heading? In my own view, yes, that is where we're heading. I think that the UK in particular has had a very long fascination with competition as being the means of driving public benefit and of course in some ways competition has driven public benefit but in other ways it most definitely hasn't and if you I think in an ideal world we would have an intelligent system architect and the intelligent system architect would make sure that there were low carbon electricity 24 hours a day whatever the weather and would effectively choose the mix 
and then the government would use incentivization tools rather than com competition tools to make sure that those are delivered at best value to consumers. Mm, that's, that's, that's interesting. So when you look at the case of the UK, because and, and that's where your expertise is centered, you were very clear that you want to talk about the UK, not the rest of the world. But when you look at the UK, uh, the UK is a country that has made a very clear commitment to be carbon neutral um, in 2050. And um, when we look at the numbers, um, one wonders if you don't build large numbers of nuclear plants, is there a viable path to get to that um, without nuclear? And, uh, and I wonder if, 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 you, if you have analysis that, that speaks to this. Um, can, can you build enough wind turbines in the offshore to make a difference? And even if you do, you still have the system problem that you talked about, which is the wind doesn't blow all the time. So how do you, how do you back that up? Um, what's, what's the conversation in the UK on this point? So um, there, are, there are different views around, around it. I think before, before the government set the net zero target and made it legally binding, I think it's definitely the case that, that there can be a really big expansion of offshore wind and solar and that th those things will happen and should happen. I think that if you're actually trying to achieve net zero, it's very difficult to do it without nuclear. I think the, there was a, the most recent study was by the Energy Systems Catapult, which is a government funded body. And a difference between the Energy Systems Catapult and other studies is that they, they look at the whole system. So they look at heating, they look at industry, they look at transport and they look at electricity. And their, their conclusion is, it might just be possible, but it's very risky and much more expensive if you try to do it without nuclear. So their, their, their recommendation is that building nuclear um, of a design like Hinkley Point C, because I would just say again, 12 years, two and a half billion pounds to get a detailed UK design. The, um, um, it's, a, it's a low or no regret decision, provided that we can make sure construction costs come down. And we're very confident that we can because we're into copy. And, and I think the Sama had discussed the analysis that we did uh, very recently in our, in our report that the MEA re released that highlights exactly what you said, that these um, series effects are real. They're not fantasies at all. Uh, we're seeing them both um, already um, at Sizewell, but we're seeing them in the U.S. at the, um, the, the project at the Vogel plant where, yeah. the, where Unit 3 was very expensive. Unit four is actually save, having showing substantial savings, and clearly, um, when we look at the experience in countries that have continued to build, um, Korea, Russia, China, you see that the price becomes very low very quickly and is very stable. And we, we start to see numbers that look a lot like, um, you know, three thousand or so. I don't know if that's dollars or euros some month. Um, per kilowatt hour, which is very, very competitive and mm -hmm. whatever it is we, we call our framework is not a market anymore. Yeah. Um, we, are, we are hopelessly behind schedule, but I'm going to let everyone uh, continue talking and we'll hopefully they, they won't pull the plug on us. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next speaker and then we'll have a bit of a conversation. And that is George uh, Baravis, who is the partner um, and head of nuclear with Sherman and Sterling. Um, he um, advises lenders, governments, and sponsors on the development of civilian nuclear power programs and the financing and construction of nuclear plants. He's worked on projects and transactions all over the world. Um, he is a member of the board of our partner in this, um, in, these, in the creation of these policy briefs, the World Nuclear Association. And before becoming a nuclear energy lawyer, he worked as an engineer for a nuclear power plant engineering firm. So. Um, George brings um, a wealth of experience to this, and so uh, we look forward to your comments. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bill, and uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for having me here. It's a real pleasure and honor to be participating in this great panel. Um, um, I think that the presentations that we had already are, were excellent, very, very uh, informative, and uh, especially uh, Julia's view on the UK was uh, to me really interesting and uh, with a lot of good information. I think I always thought that the UK was one of the most important new build markets, uh, but since we have the UK uh, view from Julia, I will try to give a view from the, my experiences around the world and uh, what I've seen advising governments as well as financial institutions. 
So if we can go to the next slide. Um, when you're looking at financing and how you are uh, looking at the issue of developing a nuclear project and the financing, the issue boils down to risk. What is the risk of the project? Why would an investor put money into this project? Remember, you know, we, these, get to be, uh, these projects tend to be very complicated and big and massive. Fundamentally speaking, though, in the end, you have, from a finance perspective, you have one product, and that's power or, you know, heat, district heat. But that's what you have, and that's what the value is. That's what you get out of all this, this big project. And that's why you have to think about how you're going to sell that and for what, uh, for what price. So as investors look at these projects, they look at risk um, in two different categories. First of all is having financial risk. Financial risk is, will I get my money back and with some uh, profit in the long term? So what is the financial risk uh, primarily driven by? Uh, historical in experience and current experience of project delays and cost overruns. Unfortunately, we hear that too much in this industry, and there's good reasons for, for that happening, and there's good reasons to, good ways to avoid it, and we can talk a little bit about that later. There is the issue of the long-term regulatory and power market uncertainty. Uh, if you're trying to build a nuclear power plant and you don't know at what price you're going to be selling the power, uh, two years from now, it's virtually impossible to model it and to make any kind of rational investment decision. Also, the need for long-term human resources development is very important, especially in countries that are building nuclear for the first time. This is a long lead item. You have to work uh, many years in advance before you actually have an operating nuclear power plant. The significant amount of finance and the long development and construction periods, which creates you know, the cost of money. And finally, of course, the issue of nuclear liability, which is not a financial risk per se, but the potential for nuclear liability and how that's channeled or not channeled to the operator, depending on the legislation or the relevant conventions, is very important from a financial uh, investor point of view. And then you have the reputational risks. Um, and what do I mean by that? Uh, there are social perceptions associated with nuclear, and people have very, very strong opinions, personal opinions. Uh, I think a lot of us that are in this industry have uh, witnessed it actually where people uh, have personal opinions towards yourself because you're involved in this industry. And uh, that's the reality. I mean, that is just the way it is. Uh, the issue of political risk in public acceptance is always very, very heightened and very important. And also the post Fukushima environment and nuclear safety concerns. That is something that has gone to the highest level of board considerations when they're looking at investing in new nuclear nuclear non-proliferation and how the nuclear technology relates to the development of nuclear weapons is another reputational concern of financial investors. And then, as we talked before, a little bit about the radioactive waste management and disposal, which is you know, a practical issue and a technical issue, but also very much a policy and reputational issue. Finally, and this is a point that I always like making, is that the project delays and cost overruns also tend to create reputational risk matters. Investors, nobody likes investing in projects that are delayed or, um, or, 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 or too expensive because it makes everybody look bad. So the issue of cost overruns and budget overruns is, and delays is also a reputational risk for investors. Um, can we look at this next slide, please? So how do you kind of uh, look at risk and try to minimize this risk? First of all, I was very pleased to hear um, the discussion before about government support with uh, um, the introduction by Salma about how government support is essential here. And uh, I, keep, I, say, I say that always as well, that this is necessary, but I think it's also very important to understand why is it necessary? Because I do hear the argument very, um, a lot of times where just saying, well, if you need government support, then that means that it's no good since you cannot compete in the free market and all that. Well, the thing about nuclear is the reason why you do nuclear in this day and age is that the, the benefits of nuclear energy are what I call sovereign in nature. You cannot put these benefits into the economics of a specific project. So if you look at the issue of energy security, you know, you can be building nuclear power plants in Europe because you want to avoid having to import gas from other parts of the world. Energy diversification, you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. Climate change, of course, which is an important consideration around the world today. Industrial development, developing an industrial base in, in your home country. 
promoting higher education, highly trained workforces. This is a developing societal structures, developing good jobs, uh, communities, which is very important for a lot of governments that develop nuclear power plant. Uh, promoting research and development, which has different other implications, sustainability, as well as other long-term benefits that nuclear provides. So when you look at all these benefits and you see, you're sitting there, you're trying to analyze the economics of a nuclear project, none of this factors into the economics. A bank that's going to look into this is not going to say, well, I'm going to get some energy security, therefore I can get more money. It doesn't work like that. So the governments, the society in general, benefit from the development of the nuclear project. So if the society will benefit, then the government can value these benefits, and then that's why you're going to need to have some support up front in order to balance the long-term benefit. Um, next slide, please. But what are the issues that you can put in a project and you can talk about uh, in a project uh, risk analysis? And Julia talked a little bit about these issues as well. But the, the key is to minimize the project risk. And how do you do that? First of all, the safety issue. Of course, this is massively important in this industry, demonstrating a safety culture, which will allow you to proceed with your project. Otherwise, the regulators will just stop you. So you just need to have a good safety culture. Design, complete detailed design, recently constructed reference plan using proven supply chain and construction team. Exactly what uh, Julie was talking about before about the UK EPR. This is precisely, and this is a, something that happens all the time, all over the world, where you get inside these projects, you get in these governments, and then you hear some people just say, I want the newest, I want the latest, I want the best design. And you know, the, the, the proper approach is, don't go for the newest, don't go for the best, go for something that you know works, has been constructed, and try to replicate it as much as possible. This is very, very important, and we keep making the same mistake around the world. Um, this is from a little bit from an uh, owner point of view because uh, a lot of my advice goes to owners and governments, but the vendor management of how do you manage your vendor? Who's going to be building your nuclear power project? An integrated project delivery team with key personnel experienced in building nuclear power projects and experienced subcontractor networks. You don't want people doing things for the first time. And when I talk about key personnel, I mean, I, speak, I mean, talk about the specific people. You want to know the few people that are going to be leading the project, that they've done this before, they've actually built the technology that they're building for you, and they're going to do it by replicating their previous experience. And also, you want them to be using the same supply chain to the extent possible. Now, on the other side, on the owner management issue, it is very, very important to have an experience in managing large construction projects. You have a lot of countries around the world that are always very uh, excited about new nuclear, and you look at their experience in handling large construction projects, infrastructure projects, uh, because they've never done nuclear, uh, is not there sometimes. So that is a very big problem. So looking, working together in the project management is the best way to minimize risk. What we like talking about, and somebody that I know that I always mentioned this, is that we want the project management to be done by the vendor implemented by the vendor, by what, but with hands-off leadership by the owner. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the owner has to own the project. It is their project. It is in your country. It is in your land. It is fundamentally yours. However, you have to allow the vendor to do what they know how to do best, but you need to lead them by hands-off. Do not interfere into what the vendor knows how to do, but you have to show that you are leading the project you're responsible for the project and you're responsible for its overall, say, uh, overall uh, success. So that ends up being an owner vendor partnership in teamwork. A good contract, I always say, it should not be your guide, it should be your guide, not a manual for filing claims. And unfortunately in this industry, we have uh, uh, sometimes a bad um, experience with that, with a lot of arbitration and claims against each other. Uh, next slide, please. So the regulatory process and interface are very important, having clear and established interference mechanism, interface mechanisms with the regulator, the capacity and capability of a regulator. Again, this is most important in places that are developing nuclear for the first time. Uh, who's gonna be the regulator? Do they have the capacity? Do they have the capability? Cooperation between regulatory authorities. Sometimes we see uh, where you know, the environmental agency wants to regulate something that the nuclear agency wants to regulate. So having a clear collaboration in understanding who is responsible for what is very important. And also looking at the licensing process and 
trying to determine how much of the country of origin licensing can you use in your own new in your in new build in a country for a new build project. Um, host government and export government supporting structures. We can talk about bilateral nuclear cooperation and export controls, nuclear liability issue, industry participation, human human resource development. You need to have this government to government support and framework in order to build the nuclear project on top of that framework. And also, as I mentioned before, the development of human resources is a long lead item. If you're gonna be building a nuclear power plant, you're gonna be operating it from eight or 10 years from now, you better start training people for starting today. Um, next slide, please. So when you're looking at nuclear financing, it really is a very unique investment model. It does employ some of the same sources of financing as you find in traditional project financials. TED, equity, some commercial banks, some investment funds, export credit agencies, which see, you see in any traditional project financing. However, the unique risk profile of nuclear restricts the use of limiter or non-recourse funding as a significant model. So nuclear financing also requires alignment also, uh, among a variety of stakeholders, industry, environmental groups, the public, and other advocacy organizations. So state support is really a key factor in obtaining sufficient capital to fund a nuclear project and requiring the financial, regulatory, legal, and social environmental investments needed. Um, I just wanted to make a, uh, a, a point here because it just happened a couple of days ago with the United States DFC. There's a policy change of the DFC, which is gonna be a major, major development, allowing for nuclear projects to be part of their uh, part of their investment strategy. And I think that I'm hoping at least is gonna facilitate a renewed discussion among other development finance institutions and multilateral development banks to look again at their policies. A lot of these organizations we've seen in the past have policies against nuclear, sometimes uh, understandable, sometimes are not understandable, but uh, at least there has to be a discussion about why that policy is there and it can't just be a pure uh, emotional or just view about, well, we just don't do nuclear kind of thing. I think this is an important issue where you're looking at climate change, where you're looking at pollution, where you're looking at this post COVID world. I think it's an important point that the industry and everybody should focus on to see if multilateral development banks have to look at, again, their policies to see if we can facilitate investment from them. Because I think these kind of um, infrastructure projects that are looking at societal benefits are specifically the kind of projects that these multilateral development banks are there to support and fund. And um, my ne last, next slide. Um, just This is just a pictorial of what I was saying before, that government support structures are evolving, uh, but are necessary. Um, solutions that are today anchored around expert credit and agency and vendor financing, but that's not enough. There's no significant multilateral support, as we said. And there's no real precedent or standard model to look at. There's not just one place around the world where you just say, well, this is how we're gonna do it. This is how we finance here and this has been successful. So we have to develop it every time that we go into a new project. Um, and that concludes my presentation, Bill. Excellent, thank you very much. And um, let, let me pick up on one of your, one of your last points. Um, and um, we, we did, we were watching very closely with the, um, the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation's change in policy. I think that was, I agree with you, it's very important. I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you think um, policy changes from the multilateral funding institutions might change the picture for uh, technology, for nuclear and, and other, other technologies that, that require big capital um, expenditures. Yes, I, I think that it's very important to start that dialogue. I mean, sometimes, and we've tried this in a number of uh, occasions, to even have a dialogue with some multilateral uh, development banks about, fine, you know, you don't uh, support nuclear projects. Can you tell us the policy reason why? What is that you're concerned about? What are the issues? And sometimes they don't even want to ex uh, exchange views or explain that position. It is such a uh, a political position and it's a very dogmatic position. So I think having that discussion up front, because there could be different ways that you can look at financing of a nuclear project. For instance, um, you know, a nuclear project might need a port in order to allow it to build, to bring in equipment. Could a multilateral organization that does not necessarily want to finance a nuclear reactor f help finance the port that's going to be needed for the nuclear project? 
there could be different ways that we can look at this in order to understand what are the sensitivities of the member states of each of these organizations and how they can fit into the big picture. But I think with the urgency that we're looking at uh, today on climate change and in the world, I think it is very, very important for them to develop, to, to look into their policies because we need this kind of multilateral support. The numbers for nuclear are enormous. Uh, they need the spreading of the risk and exactly multilateral development banks are there to spread the risk among all the member states. Thank you very much for that. Um, so again, we're we're far over schedule, but I'm going to let us go on for maybe another nine minutes, if that's if that's okay with the panel, um, to get a little bit of discussion. But let me give Sama a chance to give just maybe a one minute review of where nuclear technology is today and what options are going to, are going to coming onto the market. You'll have to unmute. We still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? There you are. Yes. Okay, good. So somehow my, my headphones stopped working in the middle of the thing. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, a lot of these things that I, that I mentioned uh, have been said by, by uh, some of you. First of all, I think that um, the, the cost of existing projects is going to come down for large projects, but we are looking at uh, small modular reactors or even advanced reactors that are going to be seen, in our opinion, uh, from the, particularly from the financing point of view, a game changer, because this, these reactors are smaller, they are going to be more affordable, and they are going to perhaps uh, be suitable for different countries with different uh, uh, infrastructure situations. So that is the first thing. The second thing that I think is just as important is what was mentioned by Julia and is the importance of nuclear heat. Uh, most, uh, uh, most models right now, most uh, scenarios that we have seen that model decarbonization going to the 30s, 50s, etc. zero of those models or very few of those models consider nuclear heat. And nuclear heat, I mean, remember, Nuclear is one of the only uh, low carbon technologies that actually produces heat and electricity. You cannot have this with wind or solar. So this is a great opportunity for, for nuclear projects to contribute to the uh, abatement of other emissions that are beyond the, the, the energy emissions. So those are great opportunities. And then finally, uh, and this is something related to the taxonomy, uh, sometimes uh, we consider uh, looking at the significant harm or no significant harm, we wonder what would be the significant harm of eliminating from the table uh, currently the, the energy source that produces the largest amount of low carbon electricity in the OECD country. So that, that definitely is a significant harm that may or may not need to be considered. So perhaps maybe that is the, the summary of, uh, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, Bill. Close enough. Thank you. Um, so in the last few minutes, I'll get, ask a couple of questions and ask the panel to react. And, um, and, and I think first, thank all of you. I think all these discussions were very, very good. But let me start with, um, with Julia because um, we have a question from the audience, which I think is very insightful. And I'll, I'll just sort of read what he has here. Um, he says that much of your plan to reduce construction costs is contingent on shifting um, Higley Point C's construction workforce and supply chain over to Sizewell C. But if there is a long delay in moving forward with, with the RAB or some other issue, um, how, what, at what point does it become impossible to take advantage of those savings and experience? And when do you start to lose the supply chain and the workforce and when does it become a problem? Uh, that is indeed a very insightful question. If only this person were working in the UK government. <laughs> the, the answer is, provided we can replicate the design. So there's no, there's no, there's no, um, there's no change in standards and codes which obliges us to redesign. Then we always have a saving by building the same design. As I said, it's cost us two and a half billion to get a UK approved design for the UK EPI in detail. Um, but obviously, in, term, in terms of the supply chain, um, something like a quarter of the Langer workforce works on Hinkley. They've, they've, you know, they've gone up this huge skill curve of learning how to work on a nuclear site. It sounds all techy, but some of it's as basic as how do you get 
a large construction workforce through security to work, literally to work on a nuclear license site. There's a lot of very clever stuff going on with digitalization and with modularization. There's some really great learning. And it's such a shame if we can't take advantage of that. I mean, it's never going to be a project of, you know, on block moving 2,000 people from here to there. It's always going to be a question of moving the supervisory teams and the systems. But even those, the teams will dissipate from Hinkley into other industries um, or possibly out of the construction industry altogether and likewise right across the supply chain unless we actually take advantage of the opportunity to make a real success story out of a copy reactor project. Thank you for that. And, I, and I, I've, I've toured a lot of these skills development activities in the UK. It's extraordinarily impressive and it really is a world class model for um, how to do this right. It's very impressive what, what's been accomplished there. But let me ask George, look at, look at this more broadly, because I think that that question is very relevant um, to where we are with nuclear. As Sama pointed out in her presentation, we're at a point with these Gen 3 plus plants uh, where we've now built some of them um, at great cost and great suffering and expense. Um, and now we have supply chains for many of them. We have experienced managers. We have um, um, workforce. We've got all these pieces. Um, but the next projects are all very un unclear. Um, what, what's your view of this from an investment standpoint? Do you think that this is that the, there's a way of seizing this opportunity and, and highlighting to investors that this is the time to strike? Absolutely, and I do think that this is a very important consideration. When you look at the fact that we've spent the past 15 years trying to develop these Gen 3 reactors, um, all the time that went in, all the lessons learned, all the missteps, and now finally we have the EPRs working, AP1000 is working, BVR is working, um, you know, the earlier ABWR is working, it seems crazy to me that we're not making more of this. You know, we just need to repeat, do the same thing over and over and over again. We know that it works as Julia was talking about, you know, the, uh, the, the, the savings are just tremendous. Once you know how to do something, you just replicate it. I mean, this is just basic things that we know in our own lives. When you replicate something, it's just easier the second time around, the fourth time around, the fifth time around, even much, much more. So I do think that this is the time to start replicating what we've learned and build the same technologies. Not that we should not focus on the next generation because they have a lot of advantages there of scale and you know safety issues and things like that, but it should be a gradual move to that and we should be building what we already know can be built today. Okay, thank you very much. And let me, let me move on to a question for, for aimed mostly at Sean, but I'll ask others to react as well. Um, so, and I, I think Sean, you mentioned, and I forgot the number, the IEA, um, we call it, we call them our sister organization for what it's worth. Um, we they they have indicated that emissions in the last year have been about seven percent below the previous the previous year. I think that's about the number they've been using. And um, and you were you were sort of celebrating that, but also indicating that well that's that's not quite as far as we need to go. We need to do this for for several years. But the reality is that that's almost entirely because of the pandemic. It's not because of anything anyone has done. With deploying renewables or anything else, it's really it's really all because of the, the lack of economic activity, and I think there's a real threat that as we rebuild economies, that these numbers will go back up. Because I think, as you well know, um, before the pandemic, we had uh, historically high levels of CO2 emissions um, around the world, and there really wasn't much sign of of abatement. Um, so is so while you, you and others have done you know, yeoman's work in moving uh, these green investments forward, um, do you see that we're having an impact? Are, are, we, are we doing enough? Um, and are we, are we, or do we have all the arrows uh, in our quiver and are we using them effectively to make, to make a difference in reducing CO2 emissions? Well, it's not strict, strictly speaking that we weren't having any impact, um, William. <clears throat> in fact, last year's figures were basically level globally. Um, this year's the down seven or eight percent. Of course, it's a cessation of activity in in some areas, uh, notably transport, and that's as much terrestrial, not so much aviation. Although aviation is a big contributor. Um, in Europe, emissions went down five percent last year, and the economy was not in deep recession last year. It was beginning to burble along. So clearly, in advanced economies, there's plenty of potential to do this. 
Um, the outlier, there's a couple of outlier economies, the US, for example. I mean, there are some doubts about those figures, notably the calculation of fugitive emissions. It looks like, in fact, our emissions from the gas sector are higher than we've been estimating as a result of leakage factors in the life cycle in some areas, notably pipeline distribution. So, uh, you know, a word of caution on some of those figures where we get to know. But it's clear that we are making progress. It's also clear that in places like India, coal is actually not financially viable anymore. You know, we have some, according to some institutes, some 40% of, if not more, of Indian coal-fired power stations running at a loss at the moment. And you're not getting anything new built. And you're now bidding to uh, get some of the people, some uh, uh, senior figures in India talking about a relatively quick phase out of coal, coal because of a cheaper alternative forms of, of energy. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot happening around the world that gives us some reason for hope in the energy mix. Noting that energy mix, that the energy mix is not the only, sorry, the electricity mix is not the only thing. I mentioned vehicles earlier. I'm extremely optimistic about a rapid shift in terrestrial transport. I think we will be shocked by 2030 what's happened in a 10 year period. But there are many other areas to work on. We're not doing that well on deforestation. That is a major source of emissions globally. We need to be ra rapidly reforesting in emerging markets, in tropical zones specifically, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, my end point on that is to say there are green shoots, but there's a huge amount of work to be done to take it forward. So I'd go back to my original point earlier. We will need managed markets to achieve a rapid transition to a low carbon and unfortunately climate resilient planet because as you would know we now have baked in permanently a significantly increased level of volatility in our world for the 21st century we just can't escape that now we will see sea, uh, sea level rise storm surge and more pandemics and we have to prepare for that so the the capex is not just a mitigation that's required now it's an adaptation resilience. So I think that's all going to happen. I mean, the positive side of all of this is we're talking about the need for substantive industrial policy to make this transition. This is, not going, this is a bit of a harking back to the 1940s and 1950s in Europe. Europe didn't grow with free market laissez-faire eco economies in the 50s. It grew with different forms of managed industrial policy in France and in Germany, of course, to this. In a sense, we have to do that, do it on steroids, of course. And that will require making hard choices about what we have to abandon. This is the year to appreciate the need to abandon the past and build the future. And when you see the IMF CEO talking about building back better, you know that this is getting mainstream currency, this idea that we do have to build back. Not everywhere, of course, but it certainly gives us all room for hope that this is beginning to be... Um, addressed and taken up by all the parties concerned. I guess the next 18 months will be material in determining the extent to which we do in many countries, unfortunately the US, bolster the uh, dinosaurs of the past and avoid making decisions about growing in the uh, future. And that will then determine how hard the next 10 years is going to be. Um, I wanted to just make one comment, by the way, on taxonomy, uh, a comment you mentioned about new technologies. We did make a point in the EU taxonomy about the potential for new nuclear technologies coming through that needs to be considered. The current EU taxonomy investigation is about existing technologies being deployed. It doesn't at all rule out any future technologies. I want to say that because I'm actually incredibly optimistic about some of the new technologies coming through. And I note news today about uh, fusion reactor in southern, next stage, next milestone in southern France being developed. And I'm certainly thinking that work needs to be continued in R&D in that area and governments will need to essentially, I would say, pursue every available option avail on, the, on, on the table until such time as we're certain we've achieved a low carbon transition. We can't afford at this stage to be saying hydro, we don't want to do hydro because we're going to do enough of solar. As much as I'm optimistic about what we can do, everything needs to be pursued in the next 10 years until such time as we're sure. Thank you very much. And I think you transitioned to sort of a closing statement. So I'm going to 
go on to George and give George a, 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 com, a, a sort of a closing comment. Um, and if you have some prognostication about where you think things are going, we'd love to hear it. Um, increasingly, I'm, I'm optimistic that a lot of uh, governments around the world are looking at nuclear again. Uh, some had revisited it in the past and some had, post Fukushima, there was a different debate. I think I'm seeing now things changing uh, rapidly in that sense. And I do think that there's going to be an increased um, appetite for lo looking at nuclear. I think what the industry needs to do is to be more um, resilient in addressing the challenges nuclear has. Uh, the multilateral development banks that we said to provide financing, to provide support as much as possible. And as I said before, to start looking at this as a repeat industry, where we try to repeat the successes of the past and avoid the failures of the past and looking at the cur current situation as a transition to the next generation technologies, which we said before are exciting. So I think that there is a lot, but we need to keep working on, on addressing the challenges that we face. Yes, and, and George, let, let me say that your analysis of the ownership vendor um, relationship, um, we should have we should have a coffee sometime. I can tell you some, some stories. There's, there's lots of stories I can tell on that point. Um, but again, thank you very much. And Julia, you're going to get the final word. Um, how do you, where do you see things going? Are you optimistic? Um, what do you think is going to happen? And I was going to have my final word by way of a question to Sean, which I suppose might not be um, the ideal format for a final word. But um, I, was, I, was just I was going to ask Sean what he thinks about whether or not there's any room for, for things like the taxonomy to look much harder at the impact of technologies in a system. And we, nobody should be promoting a technology for its own sake. If you leave aside commercial interest, what we're aiming for is a low carbon system. And there's, there's a bit of an obsession with technology. So not all countries need nuclear. What all countries need is firm low carbon power. In some countries, there are no obvious ways of making it except nuclear. And so having a system which is able to distinguish between is offshore wind a great thing? Yes, it is. Is adding more offshore wind in Germany when they're also opening unabated coal plants a good thing while they shut down nuclear? Clearly it's not. And I think it's a bit of a, it, it, it's a, there's a slightly narrow approach being taken and I think a move to a much more systematic approach does this make a, a low carbon low cost system would be much more productive for um for the climate which I've sort of given you the final word <laughs> isn't she kind William <laughs> we've been very clear in the taxonomy yeah. the threshold is a threshold it's technology agnostic it's a threshold consistent with what the IPCC and we believe the IA modeling, not that that's been released, as you know, thanks to possibly board uh, veto, um, but the headlines were released in Fatih's uh, statement, uh, consistent with what they're saying about what we need to do. And we provide a methodology for that, which is 100 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, as what we believe needs to be a maximum level of emissions out of electricity generation going forward. And actually, if you're not below that, you probably shouldn't be being built at all, frankly. Um, so that's very clear, and that's technology agnostic. But what we have also said is that any energy system needs to address two no significant harm provisions. That's all. And of course, the investigation nuclear is underway. Uh, technically, that applies. If someone were to say, actually, there's way more of a problem on geothermal than anyone thought, then the do no significant harm provisions ought to be reopened there. And that, to that extent, taxonomies will be dynamic and will continue to be updated. The discussion about what should be allowed and so on should continue, investigation should continue, and it should be reviewed. We've said at the very minimum, the taxonomy should be updated every five years in Europe and potentially more frequently. It's just that the do no significant harm provision in one area, or two areas actually, it's also in waste to energy, um, uh, are a source of significant discourse and debate, that's all. But I do want to agree with you, we need to be looking at simply at whatever it takes in a system to achieve emissions reductions with, I'm actually going to say, a secondary objective of maintaining electricity supply. But of course, in your case, that's a primary objective. And from my, my perspective, it's a secondary objective. And, yeah. and that's how we should run the discussion. You're absolutely correct. 
I'm, go I'm going to I'm going to uh, I'm going to I'm going to seize the last word as it turns out uh, because I, I want to highlight that this the, the Julia's question is is really I think essential um, because um, we we've done work in this area and maybe Julia you've seen our report on systems cost and uh, maybe Sama if they haven't seen we can get that to um, all the participants um, and what we highlighted in that is exactly the point you were making which is that um, electricity systems are what people care about, not electricity technologies. And these systems have to be balanced in some way to be able to perform. And one of the things that I've been um, advocating with within with my staff is to really start thinking about um, doing analysis that looks over a 365 day period and different weather conditions so that we know we have resilient systems as well. Because it's no good to have a system that's just fantastic and low carbon um, 11 months out of the year, but then lets everyone freeze to death in the, in the 12th month. That, that, that doesn't work very well. Um, and we need to be very conscious of that. And, um, and I think that when countries start to look at the world that way, I, I think they'll look at um, nuclear and other, other technologies very differently. And I see that uh, we have just distributed the systems cost study, so you can take a look at that. Um, so uh, we're, we're, this is actually the worst overtime we have ever had with one of these, but it's because you guys have such a great panel. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for participating and all, the, all of you for your comments. Um, I, I'd love to spend time with each one of you individually as time goes on, because I think there's a, a lot to, to talk about. So uh, with that, I thank you, and I thank uh, Sama and Clement and the rest of uh, her team for putting these uh, webinars together. I think they've been very interesting, very productive. And also, once again, thank to the World Nuclear Association for partnering with us to create these uh, policy briefs.